Well, my next guest is Simon Presley from a company called Propertyology, which he founded. And he was courageous enough to argue during the pandemic and after that all these calls about 20 and 30% falls in house prices would prove to be wrong. Now, because he's not what you might call a highly respected banking economist, he probably wasn't treated as seriously by newspaper headlines as uh, some of the really well-known economists in the country. But reality is Simon totally got it right and the other guys got it totally wrong. Let's find out how come he's got these insights. And by the way, I was interviewing him over that period of time and I, I wasn't criticising him and saying he was wrong, but I was just actually putting another view out there and he does have a little bit of experience in the property game. Simon, thanks for joining us. Yeah, always a pleasure, Peter. Okay. And being a Queenslander, you don't like to crow about the greatness of Queensland and the people who come from there, but you, you did very well in your predictions and people who listen to you um, would be really happy about the, the investments they would have made because it was a buying opportunity. It wasn't there for a, for a short period of time uh, during the pandemic. But certainly that the price rises that you predicted would have netted some people some really nice returns. I've got to be honest, Peter, the, the biggest um, concern I had when we went public with our forecast was my team saying, Simon, please don't do this. Um, mm -hmm. they, they were generally worried that being the only person who was going to go on record saying there's going to be a big boom if we were wrong, we're, <laughs> like we're destroyed, right? And I, but, yep. but uh, to be honest... Um, I've never had greater clarity about forecasting property markets than then. Now, I know that statement will surprise a lot of people, but why I've never had greater clarity is because there are so many moving parts every single year to property markets, but the, the most influential parts, we knew exactly what they were going to do when COVID hit because for, for the first time in our lifetimes, mate, um, they had to disregard politics and look after humans for a change. So I, we knew what the RBA were going to do. We knew that App, what APRA were going to do. We knew that every federal, the federal and every state government were going to throw money at the economy. That's what humans do for every moment of adversity. Mm. You, can't, you can't say that in any other year other than COVID. You know, I can predict what Albo is going to do. I can predict what the premiers are going to do. I can predict what the RBA... You can't say that in any other year. So um, that's why we were so confident and some will say courageous to go public, but it, it's never been clearer um, to us than that moment in time. Okay. So, so what, what were the main drivers that made you think that there wouldn't have been a 20 to 30% fall in house prices? Yeah, well, this is a, it's a great opportunity for those who, who care to understand property markets to actually learn um, because we can all remember what, what you were told. You can remember how you felt. And now we're talking about what actually happened. There are so many correlations between property markets and share markets, but there will always be one major fundamental difference. A property is something tangible. It is someone's home. It is not a dot on a computer screen that can sometimes fluctuate quite widely. Um, you, can, you can dump a parcel of shares or you can purchase a big parcel of shares within a minute. But property values don't change unless there's a transaction that occurs and people don't transact in property very often because it's someone's home, whether it's the owner occupier who owns it or whether it's the investor who owns it. It's a big decision to even think about purchasing it and then starting the search and, and, and you, people just don't trade property. It's shelter. Um, now at the time of COVID, about six months before the international border closed and not many people were aware of this at the time, Australia had already reached an all time record low number of properties listed for sale before COVID arrived. Mm. Now, now, property markets, contrary to what people believe and those who forecast these massive downturns that were proven wrong, demand is not population growth and supply is not construction. Property prices move. It's a relationship between buyers and sellers. And more than 95% of the buyers each and every year is the existing resident population. People's lives change all the time. And when their life changes, sometimes they move home or sometimes they invest in their future. So that's the big fundamental difference between property markets and share markets is what is it? What is this you know, financial instrument? It's people's homes. 
Now, there was a record, like we had about 292,000 properties listed for sale in January 2020. When yeah, before the before border, COVID, yep. Yep, when the border closed. 292. It should have been about 350,000 if it was to be at equilibrium. So there was already a significant shortage. Now, I, my expertise is not medicine, right? But I sort of thought, logically, what would be the human behaviours now that we've closed the border and back then the Prime Minister ScoMo saying you're, you're going to be you know, sent home pretty soon and your life's going to change and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, well, the already record low number of properties for sale, to me, it was obvious was going to get significantly less because someone who had their property on the market were going to go, well, they were going to listen to all those doomsayers and go, not a good time to sell. Um, I'll take it off the market. So that, that was a no-brainer to us. There's going to be a lot less properties on the market for sell. That's supply. On the demand side of things, we're like, okay, the RBA are going to slash interest rates. Apple are going to make it um, easier for people to get credit. And there's going to be more money thrown at the Australian financial system than any of us have ever seen in our life, lifetime. That's the demand side of things. Now, we didn't know how long we were going to be in lockdown, but we were led to believe a few months, right? So I'm like, 292,000 properties for sale is going to reduce overnight to an even smaller figure. And then we're going to come bursting out because our home is still our home. And in fact, people actually burst out more than normal because some people moved town. Some people decided to upgrade their home. They, they sort of thought, geez, I'm going to be living like this with all these restrictions for so long. Um, I want a not, nicer pad to do it in. So the volume of properties that transacted over the coming years was more than the years before COVID. So that, that's, that's how property markets work. It's always a relationship between the number of buyers and the number of sellers. And most of the buyers are not the overseas migrants. They are less than 5% of buyers every year. Right. So that was the reasoning why you questioned the validity of 20 and 30% house price falls. What did house prices move by? Let's just take some cities. Um, let's take, for example, Sydney and Brisbane. What kind of rises did they have over the, the period? I think you've done some four-year um, um, analysis. What, what do they rise by? Yeah, well, I mean, the most intense year was the 2021 calendar year. Um, markets started booming as early as July, August 2020. So we're only, you know, six months after locking down, they already already started booming. But 2021, just about everywhere in Australia had 20% um, growth in that one year. Some parts of Australia had more than 30% in, in, in one year. If we look at the four years um, directly after January 2020, when the international border closed, we sort of go around the country a bit. I mean, Fraser Coast increased by 70% in the last four years just gone. The four years before COVID had increased by 6% total across the four-year period of time. Sydney, over the, over the four-year period of time, increased by 41%. That's after losing about 10% in the 2022 calendar year when RBA started in, increasing interest rates. So, so Sydney still had 41% four years post-COVID, but only 10% combined for the four years before. Perth declined by... 11% over the four years before COVID um, hit. And the following four years increased by 43%. The biggest, um, the best performers, as happens every single year, were in different parts of regional Australia as opposed to the capital cities. But everything did well. Okay. So what are you thinking about house prices now? Looking at the, the supply, demand, um, a trade-off, which is you said it was at the core of your analysis. What do you think is going to happen to house prices now? Yeah, uh, well, the last year, um, let's put some some perspective around this for, for, um, for your viewers. Last year, I mean, different cities do different things every year, but the combined capital city median house price increased by nine percent in the twenty twenty three calendar year. The ingredients for twenty twenty four, all things being equal, are better than last year. Better. Um, we, we had about six interest rate increases in the 2023 calendar year. Now, the RBA don't know for month to month what they're going to do with interest rates. But I think, I think it's fairly well accepted now that inflation this year is nowhere near as bad as what it was last year. Yeah. Um, and the RBA seem to be getting more comfortable. And lots of people are forecasting cuts at some stage, right? So, yep. so that's one key component that more affects confidence. 
but that's better in 2024 than last year. The number of properties listed to sell. Let's have a look at some official figures for you. Uh, today, there are 220,000 properties listed to uh, sale right across Australia. When COVID hit and that boom took off, it was 292,000. So there are less properties for sale. That, and that's a significant reduction um, from this time four years ago. Um, the competence of return, jobs. We've created an extra 200,000 more jobs in Australia over the last four years with all those lockdowns and restrictions than the previous four years. We're pretty similar age, mate, and we've never seen the unemployment rate this low in our lifetime, even though it's likely to trend up, um, but trend up from a really, really low base. So I'd argue that um, property buyers have never had a more stable job. Uh, they've never seen for 25 years a higher increase in wages. We hear a lot about the increasing interest rates. So if that was going to cause the big cliff that the same people who forecast the big downturn in property markets got wrong, we would have seen that by now. So clearly people, I'm not saying that everyone's you know, uh, cruising, um, but it, the, the rising interest rates have been around long enough for there to be enough evidence to produce to say an overwhelming majority of Australians have coped with this. Yeah. So it, it's, it's going to be a, um, not, not a super boom. We, we may never see that again, uh, you know, in our lifetimes, who knows. But um, double digit price growth in multiple parts of Australia is very much on the cards. So, so your argument for 2024 is don't be surprised if we see double digit growth in a lot of our capital cities? Um, I think... Melbourne and Canberra are probably our softest markets, but and they might lose a couple of percent. But I mean, you don't, if you own a property, either an, as an investor or an owner occupier, if it declines 2% in value, you don't feel that, right? It hasn't actually affected you. Um, that's probably the worst case scenario. I think, I think Perth, um, not that I would invest there personally, it doesn't have enough uh, economic diversity, but We've been on record at the start of this year saying Perth might see somewhere between 15 and 18% growth this year alone. Uh, but okay. Brisbane and Adelaide is the, um, the, the strong but also safer economic profiles. Um, but I keep saying it, the, the best performed property markets, the best for investors will be among the regions. Okay. And what is the, the most recent regional centre that you've invested in? Uh, we're, we're always investing in sort of eight to 10 at any given time. Um, while we do that, I guess, similar to the, um, the stock market investor, you know, there's always going to be bit more than just one good stock and there's always going to be more than just one good property market. But what might be the best location for Peter to invest in will be different to Simon investing because our personal circumstances, are, our portfolios are different and our budgets are different. So I'm not going to give away those trade secrets, mate, but um, the world is our oyster. I mean, we do have, 400 individual townships across this huge country. There's only eight capital cities. The regions will be the best of four markets yeah. every but, year. But, but Simon, like, I'm not asking you to give away trade secrets. I, I want to give away one secret. Yeah, like, and I'm thinking Byron Bay, we know, shot the lights out and ridiculously, well, but it's demand and supply. But is it, is it logical then if we move away from Byron, there'll be like a ripple effect? And I remember places like Kingscliff and Cabarita did really well in Byron. Do you come south to places like Brunswick Heads? and what, Is that logical that there's probably going to be a benefit to the fact that people can't get into Byron and they'll look at the, the next associated regions? No, Byron's, um, it's always been a luxury market and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's landlocked. It's, it's always been a tightly held market, but there were so many people that just on the emotion with COVID, you know, mm. you had that much greater financial capacity that they piled in, but the Byron's probably lost about 10 or 12% um, in value over the last, um, you know, 12, 12 months or so. Uh, and, and Kingscliff and that sort of, you know, um, really affluent uh, Northern regions area. Noosa was a bit like that as well in, in Victoria, um, Great Ocean Road, places like Torquay and Lawn, uh, same sort of thing happened. Lots of people who had a desk job in Melbourne on a really high income said, hey, let's get out of the big smoke and let's go and buy that, you know, that home in Lawn that they might have spent $3 million on or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And some of those people are now going, 
yeah, that was an impulsive buy. We really don't need that now. And there's been supply uh, come back on the market. All right. One last question, because you are a banana bender. Uh, if we can, <laughs> can call you guys that. Um, when a lot of capital cities were doing really well, Brisbane sort of lagged. Yeah. But it's been doing really well lately. And I must admit, watching Ange, uh, Andrew Winter on that program, Love It or List It, a few, you know, three or four years ago, Brisbane properties really looked, particularly for someone in Melbourne or Sydney, what they could sell for and buy in Brisbane was actually very, very attractive. Is that kind of bargain still in Brisbane or is it starting to disappear? No, no, no bargains. Not, I don't know that there really are any bargains anywhere in Australia. But, you know, Brisbane's story, like every other location and every other year, Peter, it's an economic story. You're, you're 100% right. Um, Brisbane had a decade in the doldrums. Um, it didn't really lose any value, but for yeah. 10 years, it's, its market just, you know, chugged along in first, first gear. And it's no coincidence that the Brisbane economy in that same 10-year period of time um, was very, very underwhelming. I, I wouldn't say Brisbane's economy is booming today. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of slightly small event called the Olympic Games. You might have heard a thing or two about. Mm. Peter, that's creating a lot of controversy um, at the moment. The, the Brisbane economy isn't too bad, um, but you know, there are other parts of Australia where the, where the economy is probably, probably better and their property market will outperform Brisbane. Okay. Simon Presley from Propertyology, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. Bye-bye. 